Wage, Labor, and Capital by Karl Marx. This is um, chapter one and chapter two, because they're very short, I'm putting them together. Um, chapter one, preliminary. From various quarters, we have been reproached for neglecting to portray the economic conditions which form the material basis of the present struggles between classes and nations. With set purpose, we have hitherto touched upon these conditions only when they force themselves upon the surface of the political conflicts. It was necessary beyond everything else to follow the development of the class struggle in the history of our own day and to prove empirically by the actual and daily newly created historical material that with the subjugation of the working class accomplished in the days of February and March 1848, the opponents of that class, the bourgeois republicans in France and the bourgeois and peasant classes who were fighting feudal absolutism throughout the whole continent of Europe, were simultaneously conquered, that the victory of the moderate republic in France sounded at the same time the fall of the nations, which had responded to the February Revolution with heroic wars of independence. And finally, finally, that by the victory over the revolutionary working men, Europe fell back into its own double slavery, into the English-Russian slavery. The June conflict in Paris, the fall of Vienna, the tragic comedy in Berlin in November 1848, the desperate efforts of Poland, Italy, and Hungary, the starvation of Ireland into submission. These were the chief events in which the European class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the working class was summed up, and from which we proved that every revolutionary uprising, however remote from the class struggle its object might appear, must of necessity fail until the revolutionary working class shall have conquered that every social reform must remain a utopia until the proletarian revolution and the feudalistic counter-revolution have been pitted against each other in a worldwide war. In our presentation, as in reality, Belgium and Switzerland were tragicomic, caricaturish genre pictures in the great historic tableau. The one the model state of the bourgeois monarchy, the other the model state of the bourgeois republic, both of them states that flatter themselves to be just as free from the class struggle as from the European Revolution. <clears throat> but now, after our readers have seen the class struggle of the year 1848 develop into colossal political proportions, it is time to examine more closely the economic conditions themselves, upon which is founded the existence of the capitalist class and its class rule, as well as the slavery of the workers. We shall present the subject in three great divisions. The relation of wage labor to capital, the slavery of the worker, the rule of the capitalist, um, the inevitable ruin of the middle classes, petty bourgeois, and the so-called commons, peasants, under the present system. The commercial subjugation and exploitation of the bourgeois classes of the various European nations by the despot of the world market, England. We shall seek to portray this as simply and popularly as po possible, and shall not presuppose a knowledge of even the most elementary notions of political economy. We wish to be understood by the workers. And moreover, there prevails in Germany the most remarkable ignorance and confusion of ideas in regard to the simplest economic relations from the patented, patented defenders of existing conditions down to the socialist wonder workers and the unrecognized political geniuses in which divided Germany is even richer than in, than in duodecimo princelings. We therefore proceed to the consideration of the first problem. Chapter 2. What are wages? How are they determined? If several workmen were to be asked, how much wages do you get? One would reply, I get two shillings a day and so on. According to the different branches of industry in which they are employed, they would mention different sums of money that they receive from their respective employers for the completion of a certain task. For example, for weaving a yard of linen or for setting a page of type. Despite the variety of their statements, they would all agree upon one point, that wages are the amount of money which the capitalist pays for a certain period of work or for a certain amount of work. Consequently, it appears that the capitalist buys their labor with money, and that for money they sell him their labor. But this is merely an illusion. 
what they actually sell to the capitalists for money is their labor power. This labor power the capitalist buys for a day, a week, a month, etc. And after he has bought it, he uses it up by letting the worker labor during the stipulated time. With the same amount of money with which the capitalist has bought their labor power, for example, with two shillings, he could have bought a certain amount of sugar or of any other commodity. The two shillings with which he bought 20 pounds of sugar is the price of the 20 pounds of sugar. The two shillings with which he bought 12 hours use of labor power is the price of 12 hours labor. Labor power then is a commodity, no more, no less so than is the sugar. The first is measured by the clock, the other by the scales. Their commodity, labor power, the workers exchange for the commodity of the capitalist, for money, and moreover, this exchange takes place at a certain ratio. So much more, more money for so long a use of labor power. For 12 hours weaving, two shillings, and these two shillings, do they not represent all the other commodities which I can buy for two shillings? Therefore, actually, the worker has exchanged his commodity, labor power, for commodities of all kinds, and moreover, at a certain ratio. By giving him two shillings, the capitalist has given him so much meat, so much clothing, so much wood, light, etc., in exchange for his day's work. The two shillings therefore express the relationship the relation in which labor power is exchanged for other commodities, the exchange value of labor power. The exchange value of a commodity estimated in money is called its price. Wages, therefore, are only a special name for the price of labor power and are usually called the price of labor. It is the special name for the price of this peculiar commodity, which has no other re repository than human flesh and blood. <clears throat> Let us take any worker, for example, a weaver. The capitalist supplies him with the loom and yarn. The weaver applies himself to work and the yarn is turned into cloth. The capitalist takes possession of the cloth and sells it for 20 shillings, for example. Now are the wages of the weaver a share of the cloth of the 20 shillings of the product of the work? By no means. Long before the cloth is sold, perhaps long before it is fully woven, the weaver has received his wages. The capitalist then does not pay his wages out of the money which he will obtain from the cloth, but out of money already on hand. Just as little as loom and yarn are the product of the weaver to whom they are supplied by the employer, just so little are the commodities which he receives in exchange for his commodity, labor power, his product. It is possible that the employer found no purchasers at all for the cloth. It is possible that he did not get even the amount of the wages by its sale. It is possible that he sells it very profitably in proportion to the weaver's wages. But all that does not concern the weaver. With a part of his existing wealth of his capital, the capitalist buys the labor power of the weaver in exactly the same manner as, with another part of his wealth, he has bought the raw material, the yarn, and the instrument of labor, the loom. After he has made these purchases, and among them belongs the labor power necessary to the production of the cloth, he produces only with raw materials and instruments of labor belonging to him. For our good weaver, too, is one of the instruments of labor, and being in this respect on a par with the loom, he has no more share in the product, the cloth, or in the price of the product than the loom itself has. Wages, therefore, are not a share of the worker in the commodities produced by himself. Wages are the part of already existing commodities which, 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 with which the capitalist buys a certain amount of productive labor power. Consequently, labor power is a commodity which its possessor, the wage worker, sells to the capitalist. Why does he sell it? It is in order to live. But the putting of labor power into action, i.e. the work, is the active expression of the laborer's own life. And this life activity he sells to another person in order to secure the necessary means of life. His life activity, therefore, is but a means of securing his own existence. He works that he may keep alive. He does not count the labor itself as a part of his life. It is rather a sacrifice of his life. It is, it is a commodity that he has auctioned off to another. 
The product of his activity, therefore, is not the aim of his activity. What he produces for himself is not the silk that he weaves, not the gold that he draws up the mining shaft, not the palace that he builds. What he produces for himself is wages, and the silk, the gold, and the palace are resolved for him into a certain quantity of necessaries of life, perhaps into a cotton jacket, into copper coins, and into a basement dwelling. And the laborer who for 12 hours, hours long weaves, spins, bores, turns, builds, shovels, breaks stone, carries hods, and so on, is this 12 hours weaving, spinning, boring, turning, building, shoveling, stone breaking, regarded by him as a manifestation of life, as life? Quite the contrary. Life for him begins where, is that, where this activity ceases, at the table, at the tavern, in bed. The 12 hours work, on the other hand, has no meaning for him as weaving, spinning, boring, and so on, but only as earnings, which enable him to sit down at a table, to take his seat in the tavern, and to lie down in a bed. If the silkworm's object, or the silkworm's object in spinning were to prolong its existence as caterpillar, it would be a perfect example of a wage worker. Labor power was not always a commodity, merchandise. Labor was not always wage labor, i.e. free labor. The slave did not sell his labor power to the slave owner any more than the ox sells his labor to the farmer. The slave, together with his labor power, was sold to his owner once, for all, once and for all. He is a commodity that can pass from the hand of one owner to that of another. He himself is a commodity, but his labor power is not his commodity. The serf sells only a portion of his labor power. It is not he who receives wages from the owner of the land. It is rather the owner of the land who receives a tribute from him. The serf belongs to the soil, and to the lord of the soil he brings its fruit. The free laborer, on the other hand, sells his very self, and that by fractions. He auctions off eight, ten, twelve, fifteen hours of his life one day like the next to the highest bidder, to the owner of raw materials, tools, and the means of life, i.e. to the capitalist. The laborer belongs neither to an owner nor to the soil, but eight, ten, twelve, fifteen hours of his daily life belong to whomsoever buys them. The worker leaves the capitalist to whom he has sold himself as often as he chooses, and the capitalist discharges him as often as he sees fit as soon as he no longer gets any use, or not the required use, out of him. But the worker whose only source of income is the sale of his labor power cannot leave the whole class of buyers, i.e. the capitalist class, unless he gives up his own existence. He does not belong to this or that capitalist, but to the capitalist class, and it is for him to find his man, i.e. to find a buyer in this capitalist class. Before entering more closely upon the relation of capital to wage labor, we shall present briefly the most general conditions which come into consideration in the determination of wages. Wages, as we have seen, are the price of a certain commodity, labor power. Wages, therefore, are determined by the same laws that determine the price of every other commodity. The question then is, how is the price of a commodity determined?